Please find a Bible this morning and open to the book of John, the eighth chapter, the Gospel of John, chapter eight. It was the Feast of Tabernacles, a holiday, a festive time, celebrating the harvest, God's provision for his people and providing for their needs, and also celebrating the great deliverance from the land of Egypt of God's chosen people and for sustaining them during their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness in a miraculous way. A little bit like our Thanksgiving or even Christmas. People had come flocking to Jerusalem in celebration. Jerusalem was running over with people. People were sleeping everywhere and celebrating. And eventually, the inevitable, there was a moral compromise. The story is told here in John, the eighth chapter, verses 2 through 11. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw no one but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. They were excited. People usually are excited when it's a sex issue. It happened at the temple. They all came together, three parties. The sinner, her judges, and Jesus. Our situation as we come to worship today is not all that different. We too have come to the temple. We have come here to God's house, to the sanctuary. We come, some of us, feeling like sinners. Perhaps some of us feel like such sinners, we hardly dare show our faces. Or perhaps some of us come as judges, some so respectable they cannot help but look down on the sinners. And together we come before Jesus. As we meet in worship this morning, the sinners, the judges, and Jesus, I wonder what Jesus will do. That's what the Pharisees wanted to know. What will Jesus do? 
You see, they weren't really interested in the sin and they weren't interested in the woman. What they were interested in was in trapping Jesus and they had a foolproof trap. John chapter eight, verses four to six again. And they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. You see, there was apparently no way out for Jesus. It was clever because if Jesus said, stone her, as Moses commanded, then they would run to the Romans and say, sedition, sedition, only the Roman government has the right to inflict the death penalty and look what this Jesus has just done. If on the other hand, he said, well, just let her go. They could throw up their hands and say, see there, he doesn't follow the law of Moses. He doesn't enforce the church manual. They had him, no matter which way he turned, a perfect trap. What did Jesus do? Well, he didn't condemn and he didn't condone. Instead, he convicted and he converted. I'd like us to look this morning at those four words. Jesus doesn't condemn sinners and he doesn't condone sin. Instead, he convicts and he converts. First of all, let's look at that word condemn. Christ does not condemn sinners. John the 8th chapter and the 11th verse, Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. There's the word condemn. Jesus does not condemn sinners. We find it so easy to criticize, to condemn. But criticism is not Christian. Criticism is a lot of things, but it is not Christian. Criticism is exciting. Criticism is self-exalting. It makes us feel superior. It makes our egos feel strong. Again, criticism is exciting, it is self-exalting, but criticism just isn't Christ-like. Jesus said, neither do I condemn. But Christ does not condone sin. He doesn't condemn sinners, but he does not condone sin. The Pharisees were hoping that maybe they could catch him condoning sin, disregarding the law of Moses. But the truth of the matter is that it was the Pharisees that condoned sin. Had you noticed that in this story? They condoned the sin in the man that committed adultery with the woman. An adulterous situation requires two people. They only brought one. Why is it that they held the woman so guilty and let the man go free? According to the law of Moses, Leviticus 20, verse 10, both parties shall surely be put to death. In essence, here they condoned the man's sin and condemned the woman's sin. In the 11th verse, the very last part, Jesus said, go and sin no more. Jesus said, sin no more. Jesus did not encourage sin. Jesus did not condone sin. I'd like you to keep your place here in John chapter eight and turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew, the fifth chapter. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Jesus' moral standard was very high. He did not condone sin. 
Jesus' moral standard was higher than Moses' standard. Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32. Matthew 5, 31 and 32. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, except for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Jesus' standard was very high. Jesus opposed divorce. The divorce standards of the church don't come from some red book and they don't come from the general conference. They come from the words of Jesus. Jesus' standards were very high. Jesus' standards went even farther than the Ten Commandments standards. We read that in Matthew 5, verses 27 and 28. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Jesus said that this whole business of moral sin does not begin externally, but internally. External sins are the ones that we find to criticize. External sins are the ones that we take to be so serious, but it is actually the internal sin that destroys us. I remember a number of years ago, there was a car accident down at the intersection. A lady in an old Plymouth, you know, back when the cars were made, they were really heavy and really, you know, sturdy. She was driving this old Plymouth and ran through a red light and two boys met her from the side in a little Volkswagen Beetle. And as you can imagine, they came out the worse for wear. When everything had kind of stopped, one of the boys had put his head almost completely through the windshield. And the blood began to pour and it streaked down his face and it looked so serious. They put him in an ambulance, they rushed him to the hospital, into the emergency room. It looked really bad. But as they examined him, they found out that there were apparently no internal injuries. And so they cleaned him up and they sewed up his scalp and in an hour or two he was on his way home. It was about that same time that I visited a patient in that same hospital. And as I went to visit him, he sat up on the edge of his bed. He was able to get up and about and he looked quite healthy to me. Hardly seemed sick at all. A few days later, I attended his funeral. Because you see, his problem was internal. The boy's problem was external. It seemed so serious because it was so obvious. Be very careful, dear fellow Christian, that we don't presume that the obvious is the most serious. It's the internal sin that destroys us. And Jesus says that it was inside the life, inside the heart, inside the mind that lust and sin begin. Jesus hated sin. There's no merit in loving sinners if you love sin. Be very slow to vocalize the fact that you love sinners. It may be that it's simply because you like sin. There is no merit in loving sinners if you love sin. Jesus was not soft on sin. Jesus showed his strength when he was able to love sinners and yet hate the sin that was holding them back. Christ hates sin so much that he cannot overlook it. But Christ loves sinners so much that he cannot condemn. Christ hates sin so much that he cannot condone it. But Christ loves sinners so much that he cannot condemn. Neither do I condemn thee. 
And so Jesus neither condemns nor condones sin. Instead, he convicts and he converts. Notice now, as our story continues, how he convicts. And you'll notice whom he convicts. The conviction wasn't so much directed toward the lady who had sinned. Those who are quite open in their sinning are quite aware of their sinfulness. The conviction was for those who were the critics. And maybe what the Lord wants to tell us as we meet in this temple this morning, that those of us who are judges need desperately to be convicted of our sin. The issue was not whether or not this woman had done wrong. As Jesus turned the tables, the issue became whether or not her accusers had the right to judge her, even if their charge were true. John, the eighth chapter, beginning in the middle of the sixth verse. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Boys and girls, did you know that this is the only time in the entire life of Jesus that we have any record that he wrote anything? Lots of things have been written about Jesus. We have a beautiful record of Jesus' words recorded in the Gospels, but this is the only time it is recorded that he wrote anything. And those Pharisees and scribes must have been awfully happy that it wasn't kept to be put in the Bible. He that is without sin. Don't you see, sinners have never been authorized to judge the sins of others. I think we need to take it one step further. I haven't the right to judge. I haven't the right to criticize, even if I express it in nice words. As we become Christian and we try and grow in the love of Christ, the easiest thing for us is to still think kind of nasty thoughts, but say them very kindly. As if I put the knife into you very gently, then that's somehow a more Christian act. Oh, we learn to cut up people so kindly. Oh, I wouldn't say anything about them if it wasn't good. And boy, is this good. We judge, we criticize as if we had a love and a concern for the person. But dear fellow worshiper, if we loved him, if we were concerned about him, we wouldn't be saying it about him. To be in the presence of Christ is to be convicted of your own sins. John 8, verses 8 and 9. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Did you know that the devil convicts us of sins? But the devil, you see, always convicts us of other people's sins. The Holy Spirit always convicts us of our own sins. And the way you can tell whether you are listening to the devil or whether you are listening to the Holy Spirit, the devil always convicts us of other people's sins. The Holy Spirit always convicts us of our own sins. I'm inclined to think that often criticism can be a positive, a useful thing. Maybe sometimes it's the Lord that sends the criticism to open our eyes. But when it comes from the Lord, it is to criticize ourselves to help us to see the sin in our own lives. If we are seeing just the sin in others, that kind of criticism cannot come from Christ because Christ does not condemn. One more word. Christ doesn't condemn sinners. Christ does not condone sin. Instead, he convicts and he converts. 
He convicts those who judge others, and I pray, God, he will convict every one of us today of our tendency to judge others. But now we see that he converts those who are sinners. John 8 and verse 9. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Did you get the last part of that verse? Jesus was left alone with the woman. If you come to God's house this morning, a convicted sinner, before you leave this place of worship, you need to spend some time alone with the Savior. Surrounded by people, she had felt condemned. Alone with Jesus, she felt hope and she experienced forgiveness. She was converted. I love this beautiful passage from the Desire of Ages, page 462. The woman had stood before Jesus cowering with fear. His words he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone, had come to her as a death sentence. She dared not lift her eyes to the Savior's face, but silently awaited her doom. In astonishment, she saw her accusers depart speechless and confounded, then those words of hope fell upon her ear, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Her heart was melted and she cast herself at the feet of Jesus, sobbing out her grateful love and with bitter tears confessing her sins. And I think this is so beautiful. Continuing on in this passage, this was to her the beginning of a new life, a life of purity and peace devoted to the service of God. When Jesus forgives us, he purifies us and gives us peace. And we become devoted to the service of God. In the uplifting of this fallen soul, Jesus performed a greater miracle than in healing the most grievous physical disease. He cured the spiritual malady, which is unto death everlasting. This penitent woman became one of his most steadfast followers. With self-sacrificing love and devotion, she repaid his forgiving mercy. In his act of pardoning this woman and encouraging her to live a better life, the character of Jesus shines forth in the beauty of perfect righteousness. While he does not condone sin nor lessen the sense of guilt, he seeks not to condemn but to save. The world had for this erring woman only contempt and scorn, but Jesus speaks words of comfort and hope. The sinless one pities the weakness of the sinner and reaches to her a helping hand. While the hypocritical Pharisees denounce, Jesus bids her go and sin no more. End of quote. She was converted. All of this miraculous change because of one encounter alone with Jesus. Conversion brings hope. Hope for the future. Verse 11 says, go. Don't let a mistake of the past, don't let mistreatment by other people make you stop. There is nothing you have done, there is no way that others have abused you that need to ruin the rest of your life. Don't stop there. Jesus said, go. You know something, in a way we kind of like being criticized. 
because then we can feel sorry for ourselves. And self-pity kind of leaves a warm glow. Brother A has abused me. Sister B won't speak to me. And Brother C has cheated me. Poor old me. It's very natural to feel hurt and self-pity when other folks abuse us. But listen, it's also very hypocritical. Nothing makes us feel holier than criticizing people who are critical of us. You've got to really be on good ground there. Nothing makes us feel better than criticizing the people that criticize us. But listen, when you criticize the people who are critical of you, you're getting in the same boat with them. And if you don't like the boat, what are you doing in it? Every person on earth, every person in our congregation today could tell a story probably just about as mournful and just about as tragic as your own. Don't ever forget that. Life is bound to hand you a lemon. You don't have any exclusive rights to misery. It's a part of living in this sinful world. Everybody gets a lemon now, and then you can simply count on it. It's just up to you what you're going to do with the lemon. You can sit there the rest of your life all puckered up and sucking on the lemon and turning sour and becoming bitter. Or you can take the same lemon, a different use, add a little sugar and make lemonade. Christ provides the sugar. Oh, let the sweetness of Jesus' love help you overcome the hurts of life and then through you help to sweeten the lives of others. Love like Jesus loves. And so Jesus shares a tremendous lesson through this story. You wouldn't catch Christ condemning sinners then Christians, those who pattern their lives after Christ, ought not to be doing it either. But neither could Christ condone sin. Jesus was not soft on sin. Instead, he convicts us of our sins, and he converts us from our sins. He gives us new hearts. May I ask you today in your relationships with other people, are you a restorer like Jesus was? Or are you a destroyer like the Pharisees? The last paragraph in that Desire of Ages quotation I read earlier, page 462, Desire of Ages, says this. It is not Christ's follower that with averted eyes turns from the erring, leaving them unhindered to pursue their downward course. Those who are forward in accusing others and zealous in bringing them to justice are often in their own lives more guilty than they. Men hate the sinner while they love the sin. Christ hates the sin, but loves the sinner. This will be the spirit of all who follow him. Christian love is slow to censure, quick to discern penitence, ready to forgive, to encourage, to set the wanderer in the path of holiness, and to stay his feet therein. Dear fellow worshiper, when the church establishes itself as a place of healing and not a place of judgment, the sin sick will come to the church. I've only had a broken bone once in my life. And it just so happened to come on my 50th birthday. Talk about timing. I was still working at the post office. I was working on a Sunday on my birthday by myself. I always worked alone on Sunday. That's how over my whole 30 plus year career, they would give me Sabbath off. Always very thankful for that. And I came in and worked Sunday by myself instead. 
the truck had come down from Tucson and we unloaded all the mail and he went off to do whatever he did while he was waiting for about three or four hours. And then I would get the outgoing mail and load him up and he would go on his way. But I just happened to notice that the lights were left on in the truck. And I didn't know anything about the truck. I don't know, is his vehicle gonna start? He's got his headlights on and he's gone. And I thought, well, I'll see if the truck's open. I'll go in and turn the lights off. Now, that's the only time I've ever been in a big truck, you know, in a cab. And I didn't realize how high the thing was. You know, you take a couple steps and you get up in the truck. And whoa, I started looking at all the little dials and switches and buttons. Okay, which one is for the lights? And so it took me just a moment to kind of feel my way around. If I, okay, this one's probably for the headlights. And I turned off, I thought, turning off the headlights. And I thought, okay, let's see if that worked. And I went to get out. And in that moment, I thought I was just getting out of my car or a little pickup truck. Completely forgot where I was. Talk about a senior moment when you turn 50. And I just stepped out of the vehicle as if I was stepping out of my car. And I fell onto the asphalt below. And I landed on my left side and my hip on my left side had a really nasty bruise. Amazingly, I didn't break my hip, but I also landed on my left arm. And what happened is I broke my radial head on right near the elbow. I didn't realize it was broken. I just knew it really hurt. And of course, the first response you have when something like that happens is you get up and you look around to see if anyone saw. <laughs> Fortunately, I was the only one there. I thought, okay. It took a moment to kind of regather myself. I thought, okay. The lights were off. I did what I wanted to do. Let me get back to work. And as I worked, I worked for several hours after that the pain just started getting worse and worse and worse. And I realized it was more than just a little bruise. And so I called my wife. And Sandy drove that 25 minutes from home to work to pick me up and take me to the hospital, which is about 25 seconds away from where I worked the old Sierra Vista Hospital right down the street from the post office. But it was so comforting to have someone with me who understood me, who loved me, who was going to take care of me, who wasn't going to laugh at me for my klutziness, who stayed with me the four and a half hours or so that we waited in the emergency room before I got to see anybody, who held my good hand and loved me unconditionally. And she brought in with her the special meal that she had prepared for my birthday of my favorite foods. I got to eat them in the lobby there. Amazing love. And then as we finally entered the emergency room, another astounding thing happened. Not a single doctor, not a single nurse stood around gawking with their mouth hanging open. Oh, looky, looky, what happened here? And not one single person ever did lecture me for falling out of that truck. I got that from my boss the next day. But they were so gentle and they took x-rays and they made a splint and put me in a sling and they gave me some wonderful little pain pills. Friends, sometimes hospitals do their work better than churches do. Hospitals are good news because they're places where the pain stops and where the healing starts. Oh dear church family, isn't that what the church is all about? Should this be a place where we stand around gawking at the wounds that are hurting other people? Is this a place where we reprimand people for having fallen down? 
the Pharisees that came to Jesus hoped that he would pick up a stone and throw it at that awful sinner. Instead, Jesus picked up the sinner. What do you pick up? When somebody has made a mistake, do you pick up stones or do you pick up people? Let's go out of church today with a determination that we are going to pick up people because that's what Jesus does. And dear loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful today for Jesus. We're thankful for his love, for his mercy, for his forgiveness, for giving us new hearts and new minds. Lord, each one of us stand before you today as the woman in our story was before you. We're all sinners. And we're so thankful that you kneel down not to throw stones at us, but to lift us up. And Lord, our tendency is to want to judge others. Lord, help us to learn to love others the way you love us unconditionally. Lord, may we each day turn our eyes upon Jesus. May we look full into your wonderful face. And each day as we draw closer to Jesus, may we become more and more like Jesus. May we learn to pick up people and not stones. Help us to be like you, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.